watching whoa I just saw the camera swing over there watching us over the internet my name is Ken Goldberg I'm a professor here in the College of Engineering and also the School of Information and I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media which is uh, like Citrus is a program that involves a lot of cross-disciplinary research in fact we have over 110 faculty from over 30 departments and our, we are centered to some degree in the humanities. So I've also been asked to, to lead an initiative within Citrus, which we're calling the Art, Technology, and Culture Initiative. It's one of six that is particularly uh, a, a tasked with looking at, at information technology research outside of engineering. So with the, with the social sciences, with the humanities. So we have two directions. One is information technology research in art and game-based learning. And the other direction is information technology research in history, politics, and culture, which is particularly relevant to our speaker today. I want to thank Infineon for generously donating the lunches that we're eating. And I want to thank uh, Yvette Subramanian, who's in the back, for her uh, doing a fantastic job coordinating. In fact, all the, uh, the, the Citrus staff um, are, uh, do a, sp a spectacular job of organizing this, um, this center. And I would, I would, now it gives me a pleasure to, to introduce um, Professor Forte. He is, he is now, his, his, um, he received his PhD in archaeology from the U University of Rome. And he has, his research is fascinating. He does, a, he, his work is, involves integrating laser scanners, photometry, GPS, virtual reality, and a variety of digital technologies with the, the field of archaeology. Also, it combined with, with architecture, history, geography, anthropology, and the related fields. What his goal, as he'll, as he'll explain to us today, is to essentially capture the heritage, the, the, the heritage of, of foreign cultures, cultures that are distant from us spatially and also distant from us in time. He's, he's now, he has served as director of the Virtual Heritage Laboratory. He's vice president of the Virtual Heritage Network worldwide. He's co-edited um, or edited three books on virtual archaeology. And he has coordinated international archaeological projects around the world, from China to Ethiopia to Kazakhstan, Peru, Syria, Spain, and Egypt. And his travels have brought him all the way back to here in California. And I'm very pleased to say that he has now joined the faculty uh, at UC Merced. He is a professor of social sciences, arts, and humanities. And he arrived approximately one month ago. So please join me in welcoming Professor Forte. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I start from very short. Uh, theoretical discussion about uh, the past and what they mean um, in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, ontological uh, analysis. The past is, a, uh, to me, is a simulation process, a rhizome, in the term used by uh, getter interpretation. So uh, the validation of the, of the process of reconstruction of the past depends uh, on r the relationships uh, in uh, the Gibson vision the affordances between present and past societies, between our contemporary mind and ancient, contem uh, ancient minds. So this, uh, 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 this simulation is, I think, a really interactive process. And for my activity, um, I use a, a typically a cybernetic approach. Uh, the map is not the territory, it comes from the thinking on Gregory Bateson. And uh, it means that uh, we need a code for interpreting uh, the past. So it's, of course, it's utopistic, but uh, in this code, uh, there is uh, the difference between us and past ecosystems. Um, in the digital era, uh, it's so important, so crucial to understand how the digital information can float, can be transformed, convert, 
what kind of code of transmission, and what is the, the kind of transmittability, transmittability of culture. It's a great responsibility for, I think, contemporary society to save the collective memories and digital patterns to decide what validate, what we have to say, what we have to transmit, and how. Uh, typically, we think that this phase is technology-oriented. I think is much more methodological oriented. So the technology is just a part, it's not a core. And what about 3D information? Because the 3D is a part of, uh, of course, of the reconstruction. It's a, it represents the core of the knowledge process because it creates feedback. In cybernetic sense, the feedback is any reaction, any interaction, interaction between the scientists and, and the information ecosystem. So we have to rethink a culturalization center on which a complex dynamics of information converges. Cultural heritage could be an organism whose perception is transformed through time, space, and collective memory. So that is a wonderful uh, picture from the Atlas of Cyberspace representing uh, uh, what happens in terms of communication in the world. Of course, every second, every minute, we can, uh, um, we can see a growth of uh, an, a, an acceleration of information process. So what, what happens about the, in, in terms of accelerated, increased processing of information? Data and models of knowledge float with a person speed. They start from a few center, or they begin, they begin uh, from few center of uh, transmission, but they develop an impressive network of content and distributed conception. Uh, I can tell you, for example, when uh, I wrote uh, the book Virtual Archaeology in 1994, there are very few projects on virtual archaeology, 10, 20. Now we have thousands, thousands, thousands of archives and uh, gigabytes of data uh, put somewhere in the world. We know more or less from where info starts, but not where it arrives. How we can perceive it, re-elaborate it, re-share, rethink, rethought. And last but not least, we move, or we are moving, from a linear system of understanding, of learning, and we arrive, or we are arriving to reticular system of learning. We are immersed in information. It's a completely different way of taking information, re-elaborating, transmitting, reprocessing, and communicating. And uh, in my activity, I would like to emphasize the important link between uh, knowledge and communication, interpretation process and communication process. There is a very long pipeline, very long chain uh, between uh, 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 all, the, all the processes, and the communication is part of the knowledge itself. The gap of distance in time, space, and place between present and past can be partially filled by a virtual reality environment or by simulation digital processing, where the simulation is or can be you know, hopefully able to reproduce in holistic context of the cybernetic information. So the simulation represents, in theory, a possible past. Because the past doesn't exist. It's a perception process. It's a simulation process. There are many. There are many possible. So the, the core is in the, in the virtuality is very well I think uh, um, explain in, is in the potentialities in what we can really do and simulate in terms of processes, eco-interaction, and feedback. In terms of topic, I insist on the interpretation and communication as to be interpreted and uh, 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 visualized as dynamic processes. So the reconstruction is a possible final process of two approaches. One is the top down and, this, and the second approach is the bottom up. For example, in archaeology we consider bottom up what we do in the field work and we uh, consider, we, we define top down what we compare on the basis of our experience. Pattern models, cultural models and uh, categories. If another key concept in the cybernetics is the learning through the difference. 
it's interesting because we, if we increase the, the factor of difference of, between us and the ecosystem where we live, where we learn, where we understand, where we communicate, we can increase the level of information. It means that more interaction, more involvement, more reticular learning could be, uh, uh, have a result, a difference in terms of information, so more. Scientific and communication have to be integrated in the interdisciplinary simulation process. Um, I know we're here, I'm in a very interdisciplinary center, but uh, this interdisciplinary activity is not yet, not yet, I think, part, uh, the core part of training and research in digital humanities. So we, we have to, to stress much more, much more the result of um, um, and the activity of multidisciplinary um, background, skills, and experience. And the model, if a possible model, because we don't, uh, we don't have just one, but we have always a simulation model, represent a complexity of relationship. I use always the word affordance coming from the uh, Gibson uh, ecology, because affordance is concerning the uh, complexity of relationship between every uh, uh, human uh, being and the rest of the planet. So that it's very ecological approach, it's a very environmental basis, for example, because it's not so anthropocentric. There are so many factors to consider in, in, uh, in a no the model of knowledge. So this pipeline is, or well, we use uh, uh, many times the definition of virtual heritage as a process including embracing knowledge, communication, and perception. So um, I'm trying to, to describe uh, um, what I mean as a, a reconstruction circuit. Uh, a reconstruction circuit could be um, a um, circle where we try to uh, collect data at the beginning we discuss the data, we try to interpret, we start the validation process, then we work on the transparency of the information because it's part of the validation process. Then we Im implement all the information in simulation, behaviors, affordances, eco digital ecosystem, and finally we go to a, a, a communication, final communication system, and what we try to to discuss today, to show today, we, we uh, define a uh, possible reconstruction. We go to the possible reconstruction, integrating all the previous processes. Then the circuit starts again, because the reconstruction process is part of the validation. So put new questions to our knowledge, to our uh, way of learning, to our activity. So the circuit starts again. And again, data collection and so on. So it's what I would like to demonstrate is the communication is not the final process. It's just a part of the circuit of the communication. Because the communication restart, it's a loop. But this redundancy recreates new ways of information. And for example, putting new answer and new questions in the research activity. So uh, I know that it seems uh, quite simple to, uh, to define communication finally the result. It is a result. But if uh, we consider the result as a simulation, I think that we can restart. And again, as soon as we improve new technological uh, platforms or new ecosystem, for example, we could have new information not available at the beginning. So for example, uh, I take a picture <laughs> of uh, some of the software we have used in the last decades. For example, starting from uh, Multigen, uh, coming to TerraVista, 3D Site Builder, Visual Nature Studio, and open source uh, uh, platforms like uh, OpenSegra, for example, Virtual Terrain, Terrain Project, and many others. For it's, it's a part of the circuit, but the software can change the circuit now, because the circuit is the core of the method. In archaeology, um, we consider um, some important domains uh, describing the cultural landscapes. The first I consider in the reconstruction is the probably uh, yeah. 
the most interesting or the mo most difficult to, to recreate the ancient landscape. So how people were in, in, did live in the landscape. Second one, uh, the archaeological landscape. Archaeological landscape is part of the contemporary society. So it's not out of our uh, mental map. So the challenge is to create the new mental maps collecting or integrating the interpretation of archaeological landscape, what we investigate today, and the reconstruction of the past, how we imagine the past was. And finally, uh, I try to, to add a new word for this process to create a mindscape, part mind and part landscape. So it means that we learn, we perceive, we transmit, we communicate what is in the, mind, in the mental map able as mental map to create places, spaces, maps, and minds. i give you an example, uh, not just theoretical, of, uh, of the, what I, I'm trying to, to demonstrate. Uh, for example, sorry, this is, I have some problem of resolution here, but however, this is a, a WebGIS uh, uh, based on Open Seagraph. For example, here I can show you the, the it's a landscape, a Roman landscape in the north part of Rome. This is the landscape based on a satellite uh, of, um, uh, imagery. We have a one meter resolution. And here we have the same, of same landscape in the Roman times. So of course, any possible interaction depends on visualization factors, uh, reshaping the landscape and many other um, um, factors like the environment, like the ecosystems, and so on. So, of course, uh, um, what we can add in the landscape is uh, some archaeological data or the Roman hydrography or the Roman roads and so on. But we can switch also in uh, the same uh, information in the in the contemporary landscape. So that, w w what is the reality? It's the, the way we perceive different landscape. I could, this is a very intersight or holistic view of the landscape, but uh, um, of, uh, for sure I could even enter in, uh, in, uh, um, inside a, a, a place like a Roman villa, so that using always a, a web GIS, so that in, in that way I can um, visualize uh, the, the villa, I can enter inside the rooms and so on. But we can, if we have time, we can come back to um, uh, later to, to this uh, visualization and simulation process. So I uh, uh, want, want to give you an example of uh, uh, what I mean uh, as ontology of an archaeological information. So um, I like to describe a monument as a, an organism, not a ruin. Why an organism? An organism because uh, every uh, information is based on a knowledge, imagination, feeling, and uh, um, re-elaboration process we have of the same monument. For example, this is a Roman infirm dated in the second century um, AD. Um, this is an old print. So it's an it's a old print uh, uh, of the 18th century and uh, uh, made by uh, Piranesi. He was one of the most important uh, printers uh, uh, in Rome in the 18th century. And this is the same monument with a picture taken in 2003, so you see that the monument is not is really understandable because it's just a, a portion of a very complicated monument like an infirm, a Roman infirm was in the past. And this one is the visualization of the same monument by laser scanner. So it means that we have uh, here about uh, six million of points uh, reprocessed and uh, recalibrated uh, with uh, geometrical shapes after the optimization, and it's, it seems realistic, but it's, it's a measurable model, so that we have an accuracy of a three, four millimeters, so that <coughs> uh, it seems the same, but is able to 
to give back to produce much more information. Uh, this is the same in them uh, with uh, um, a simulation with a possible reconstruction after rendering and the computer graphics uh, um, and using a computer graphics algorithm. Uh, the, the, it, could, it seems this is the final result, but it's not. It's one of the possible results. And it's the same. It's another ontology of the, of the monument. So that uh, how do, in, the question is, coming from the, this premise, how do we interpret, reconstruct, and communicate in archaeology? Oh, this is an example, very old for us, because it was the beginning of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the um, 99, the beginning of 99, so we have hosted this exhibition in Rome. It's a simulation uh, flyer, <coughs> a simulation um, um, visualizer. Um, and uh, in the pipeline, we put uh, here n uh, on your left, knowledge, and finally, but not finally, in, 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 in actually communication. So the information process is uh, based on the interaction. So what about technologies? Because everything is based on a very long uh, technological adaptation, technological uh, processing, technological fieldwork. So that uh, and, oh, every, every, uh, every time we, we go to the field, we use different or new technologies. So for example, GPS system or uh, digital total station and we use different formats so that uh, the same discussion is uh, what about the format? We have to integrate so diverse uh, formats and so diverse uh, softwares so that, uh, for example, there are some uh, uh, files not uh, actually not workable, uh, in, uh, not available in, uh, after very few years so that uh, the first uh, <laughs> one of the first priority is how we can save and uh, integrate all of them in a communication process because more, more, most, the most part of them de depend on, uh, on the technology or, or on, uh, on the producer of the technology. And uh, again, another uh, information uh, really uh, f uh, focusing what, what, what we would like to do in, uh, in terms of uh, integration process is the accuracy. The accuracy and depends, of course, on the devices we use, but in archaeology, we had an, an enormous impact uh, of a new system, so that if you compare, for example, uh, uh, the last decades, uh, the resolution of satellite Im imagery, or the laser scanning, or other remote sensing, or the result of GPS, so then we can have a resolution with GPS, we have uh, two centimeters, by the satellite, we can have a 30 centimeters so that we can have a lot of diver diverse results. So that's, it is another factor that in, in able to increase information, but able also to um, give back another kind of visualization, more detail, diverse from the past. So the perception is diverse. So we can, the cultural reconstruction uh, is a, is a, the reconstruction is a cultural process, but it is also uh, it depends also on the perception factor. So that we, if we don't perceive, if we don't analyze the perception, we can understand what happens in in the domain of the reconstruction. Here I'm in Tambo, Colorado. Uh, this is a very interesting experience I had with Berkeley and uh, and, and with many students uh, uh, coming for for a field work. And uh, here uh, we are in Ethiopia, where we, we did use uh, a couple of different GPS, one static and the second one in a kinematic way. So the use of palm top computer, for example, uh, was able to give a much more interaction during the field work, so that everyone uh, was able to have uh, the PDA at the same time to, to, so to see it's in the interpretation process is really important because the collection of data depends on the interpretation. There is no system able to collect all the archaeological data in an automatic way. So if we increase this factor, we can understand what happens in terms of knowledge and in terms of identification in sites, soils, everything. So that um, much more we can have in real time, because this is a real time system. You work in real time. In Tambo, Colorado, for example, we were able to 
to create this map by GPS in six days so that we save time and we save resources, we save money in the same, uh, in the same time. But even we can correct old maps. So this is the old map of Tambo. Uh, this is a very interesting case because I have seen too many, a lot of publication uh, based on the archaeoastronomy uh, or archaeoastronomical studies on, based on this orientation. But this orientation is uh, wrong. So this is the <laughs> correct orientation. You look, so there's a 15 degrees of difference. So that's, it's important to understand that when we face a problem, so uh, the, any simulation and interpretation can create a chain of uh, events uh, and uh, errors as well. But the GPS is able also to create a digital elevation model in Ethiopia because in Ethiopia there are no maps or no maps available in micro scale. There are a lot of, of uh, heritage sites in the world without maps or without detailed map. And that's another big, big problem. So this is a, a, a survey activity. So I, I like to show uh, some of this picture because the students were uh, really uh, uh, productive and, and they, they did help us so much in, in that fieldwork. Here, for example, it's a, a very manual system uh, to take picture in a low flight with a balloon. And uh, the balloon is, uh, of course, in this case, uh, correlated with a GPS system. And uh, because of, for having, in this case, an orthophoto mosaic by the GPS correction, very detailed, a few centimeters, so that we are able, we were able, we, here are in Rome, in, uh, on the Via Flaminia, so that we are able to auto-rectify all the pictures in uh, one week, and then we can uh, uh, regenerate a map of the site uh, in a very short time. Why? Because there's no map uh, in detail. So Roma is, a, is a, an interesting case study because, you know, there's a, an amount of archaeological data available, ac apparently accessible, but they are not accessible. Apparently uh, drawn or uh, surveyed, but they are not. And it's a big challenge to save the, also the memories of all of that for a public accessibility. Or kite, like here in Tambo, because was it the, the more... Uh, most uh, interesting way to take uh, digital picture from uh, because we have a very low cost a digital camera for example and the uh, same system we have put some targets over the ground and, and then in a very in very few days we have uh, auto rectify all the pictures from the ground from um, uh, taken from the kite and uh, you know the integration of a long range a close range laser scanner was a, a challenge in uh, in, uh, in this activity, so in, uh, here in the Bay Area, you have, uh, for example, Cyrax or Leica. There are many others in uh, produ producer and deal in Europe. But uh, uh, the most important activity for us is uh, the flexibility of the devices. For example, here we have main difficulties uh, to, to put uh, the scanner in a tomb because of the space, for example, so that we have created a very uh, row <laughs> or trolley for moving <laughs> the scanner inside the, the an Egyptian tomb. Or here we are inside the Inca Palace of Tambo, Colorado with a close range laser scanner. The close range laser scanner is able to produce microns. The long range is able to produce millimeters. So it, it is in the mind uh, the process of interpretation, not in the device. For example, for a monument, microns could be too much. Depends, but if you want to measure a plaster or a microscopic re, um, surface of a painting, you should uh, need, a, for example, a close range. So this is so multidisciplinary that it's important that in a team you, we, we have to integrate different, different skills. Uh, this is uh, um, the work uh, done during the fieldwork in Tambo, Colorado. It's, this is the Inca Palace. Uh, um, uh, reconstructed by laser scanners, so that I think that after two campaigns so in Tambo, the, all the palace was about uh, 500 millions of points. 
the following question, what we can do with 500 million points, because they are not accessible, or not yet, so that we have to optimize to create meshes, so that's, it's very long, it seems that we have everything, but it's not true, that we don't have everything accessible yet. Um, in this integration activity in the field, we have used photomodeling techniques based on um, uh, software and uh, digital calibra camera calibration, here we are in Syria, and the this, this palace, dating the third millennium before Christ, is the unique example in, of Robrick's palace in Syria. But this was not surveyed before. So the only maps I have seen before this activity was just a, a CAD map in one to uh, one, uh, sorry, one to 100 scale. So that is enough or not? That's, that's a problem, that because when you have Robrick's, you know that every day, because of the erosion, because of the pollution, because of the many uh, uh, environmental factors, so the surfaces can change, can be da damaged. And here it's a very interesting case because uh, here we have in Rome, we have used a photo modeling for integrating virtual models like this one, this is the real, this is the virtual, in a virtual reality system. Or uh, with uh, a, the EPOC project, European project, uh, collaboration with the University of Leuven in Belgium, we have uh, here created uh, a 3D representation of the Temple of Mask on the Maya site of Esna in Mexico um, by software and in a very short time. So let me uh, summarize a uh, um, few things about uh, the methodological uh, view. The type of research begins, begins with field work and the post-processing activity after returning to the lab. The data have been collected through the use of laser scanning, photo modeling, photogrammetry, differential GPS systems, spatial technologies, and so on. There are a huge amount of data we produce during the field. Thousand pictures, thousand or mo uh, uh, movies, thousand points, and so on. The subsequent process involves the input of the data into 3D, creating a virtual space, interactable and open, which the data are in this I underline three times in geospatial form. So it's so important in a uh, spatial science like archaeology is to save the data in geospatial format so that you can have everything, the capacity to measure, coordinates, volume, uh, shapes, geometries, and so on. So that every scholar, every uh, student, and the, the general public as well can have a wide impact, an important impact, an important awareness of the complexity of the research done on the field. And uh, finally, uh, the final process of virtual agents could be a real-time interaction navigation. Of course, uh, how? So uh, today, um, if I have uh, five minutes uh, probably, I can show you one case because <laughs> I can uh, show you uh, all the cases of the last decades, but it's interesting because it's new. And the creation of the virtual museum based on, co of, um, based on collaborative environments, and we have just opened uh, January um, uh, 8th this year in Rome, so it's new. Uh, it's new, it's the result of two years of work uh, and uh, with a, a team of 25 people, and, uh, and it's physical and it's virtual in the same time, because there is a, uh, uh, hosted in, it is hosted in the National Roman Museum. Uh, if you, some of you uh, come to Rome is 500 meters from the Termini station, so in the middle of Rome, so that you can visit. But what we were really interested to experiment in this case a, um, a, um, in terms of uh, perception and uh, behaviors is uh, a collective experience of multi avatars. So many avatars in the same time can interact with the system in a virtual reality system with uh, capacity to have interaction, navigation, dialoguing. Uh, with uh, other virtual characters. So it's a, a new way of embodiment uh, in, term, or in cyber anthropological terms uh, and, um, and obtaining possibly what I mean as uh, mirror after. So we can display or it's possible to display our action in mind in someone's uh, embodiment in the virtual space. But the project, it was uh, quite ambitious because uh, we had uh, in, uh, uh, published a, in different way uh, the data and the output uh, of the project is 
separated or, or diversify in, in, in different platforms, a book, a uh, scientific book, a uh, second life. So we are working now in Merced so that in, I think in very few weeks or the, this, the Villa of Livia will be available in second life, even for training, because I'm very interested to, to have uh, training activities in, uh, using second life. In the virtual museum, so physically inside the virtual museum, and in internet by a 3D web JS. You have seen an example uh, first in the, my first uh, uh, display. And uh, so the, the, the project, the title of the project is uh, the, the Virtual Museum of the Ancient Via Flaminia. The Ancient Via Flaminia was one of the most important consular roads in the Roman times, connecting Rome with Ariminum in the north east part of Italy. Uh, so you see, uh, you can see a, a general view of, uh, and what we do is uh, the reconstruction of the landscape where the, the, some key sites are uh, contextualized. So uh, reconstructing plants, vegetation, soils, there is a very deep environmental analysis for reconstructing the landscape. Because uh, this is another typical, I think, mistake of, uh, an, uh, of the archaeological activity in the sense of too much anthropocentric. It's just uh, everything is in the site and out. What about the environment? What about the relationship between people, living people, organism, and the rest? Uh, I come from, I'm an archaeologist, I come from the taxonomical school. I think the taxonomy is an important part of the work, but can be the final one. We can classify if we don't understand the relationship, because we, the risk is to know so much the detail of one object, one item, and nothing about the producer, nothing about the context, nothing about the original context, nothing about the culture. Is it so transmittable, a taxonomical analysis, or is enough? This is the case uh, of, uh, uh, of the Via Flaminia near um, uh, the Tiber. So the, the, one of the core parts of the work was the reconstruction of the Villa of Livia. Livia uh, was the wife of the Emperor Augustus in the first century. Uh, it's a very strange case because it's a very important villa. It's the, the only imperial rural villa known in the, in the surroundings of Rome, but there are very few visitors, and it is accessible just a few days in, uh, in a week. So this is the, 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 the old map, uh, this is the new map, uh, reconstructed, um, reserved by laser scanner, able to correct the older one. Look, uh, the result today is not really uh, nice in aesthetic terms. There are a lot of pillars, the roof is horrible, so this is the site today. So that the problem is not only how to, uh, to have a virtual accessibility, but is even how to have an, a, a kind of accessibility in archaeological site. There are so many, not understandable, not available, or not really perceivable in a visit, in a real visit. So what we have to, to do here is the collection of so many clouds of point for, at the beginning of the work, like here, and the optimization of the point. For example, this is a, uh, uh, about uh, 1,000 of polygon. This is uh, about 60, uh, 600,000. So that the optimization uh, comes, uh, the optimization process uh, needs uh, uh, to work on the perception. I, s I give you some examples of the villa. And we, uh, we are working in particular on the uh, here on the transparent uh, um, uh, process and transparent uh, um, way to show the relationship between the reconstruction and the situation in the field on site. That's important. Typically, we see just the reconstruction, but we don't analyze the, the validation process. So how? how? What kind of relationship there are between the reconstruction and the site? So that uh, uh, typically in, our, in, in, in my work, uh, the authorship uh, is the way. Who is uh, 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 the responsible for the reconstruction? That university, that lab, okay, that's fine. It's not. Because every scholar or every uh, 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 people, every person should be analyzed and uh, comparing the process. What kind of sources you have? Analyze. So here, for example, every Paintings in you know, the third Pimpoyan style 
is, was reconstructed using some other comparison, some other pattern, so that you can compare different archives, 3D graphic libraries, so that you can have an architectural archives uh, uh, where you can analyze what kind of columns, what kind of models, what kind of uh, materials we have chosen for the reconstruction. And the comparison between cultural studies or between uh, archaeological examples or planimetries like uh, uh, this is the Villa of Livia on uh, your left, so what we are reconstructed, and some other similar examples in terms of culture, types, and in terms of uh, space. Or the paintings, it's like the same situation for the paintings, so the comparison between um, uh, plasters and, uh, and the mural paintings of the same period, of the same context, of the same culture, vegetation as well, so that every, every tree is in, is, was modeled in 3D with uh, any animal as well, so that uh, uh, it's a part of the environmental reconstruction. Ah, sorry, this is the slide, it's in Italian, but it's interesting that the case of the Villa of Livia was originally 13 million of polygons, after decimation, just one million, about, around about one million of polygons. So, on the left, uh, oh, sorry, on the left, uh, the real uh, landscape, the virtual landscape, and here by laser scanner with the avatar inside. We have used also motion capture for the, for the characters uh, modeling in the villa, and for, because there are many characters inside the, the landscape and, and the villa itself, and this is the landscape I show you very few uh, free movies about. No. Ah, oh, okay. uomini del futuro. Quando piante e campi rigogliosi avranno ricoperto queste distese deserte, che stanno camminando su quelli che un tempo furono popoli e città. Sono le vie Flaminia. Un, un impero non è altro che questo. Un'intelligente rete di strade che lega paesi e animi e li tiene assieme. Fu costruita alla fine del III secolo a.C. per unire le due sponde della penisola, da Roma alla colonia di Ariminum, collegando attraverso gli appennini okay. so i più importanti centri, for, um, comprese le città. Uh, uh, the virtual museum è un hybrid system because uh, the user can have a virtual reality interaction, but uh, uh, they have also some uh, uh, a virtual storytelling approach, so that in some part of the, of the system, they can stop and show a movie. So the movie can um, contextualize much better, for example, here the landscape and uh, the ancient cartography, the old maps with the new ones. And of course, everything is uh, um, recontextualize on the basis of uh, actual museums or sites and with of course the connection between the Via Flaminia like is today and the rest of the Roman Empire for example. So um, here for example we have used another I'll show you the, a movie because it's the, fast, the, the, the faster way to, to show you what happens in the system there, this is a, a, the virtual uh, um, reality system based just on laser scanner data so that you have different layers of information. You can navigate in through, through the villa by laser scanner. There's the simulation of the daily light, so the light changes in 24 hours, okay, virtually in three minutes, but it's a, uh, the, the light is another percep perceptual factor we would like to stress for understanding how much is important to change the simulation <coughs> and the environmental factor inside the, the virtual villa. You see that here that there are some intermediate levels of reconstruction for analyzing what is inside and what is reconstructed. This comparison is really important for what we, uh, in Greek, there's an interesting term, is anakuklosi, so the way we reconstruct in architecture. And anakuklosi is very philological. But it, it, one part is really philological, another part is creative, so that what we know and what we can imagine, because it, there's a big difference between what is really on site and what is reconstructed on the basis of top-down approach. Top-down means what we figure out in our mental archives of archaeologists. 
So for example, in coming to the villa, completely reconstructing, there are some uh, characters like the wife of the Emperor Augustus or the Emperor Augustus himself, himself able to, uh, to talk with the, the avatar, so the, the other uh, per, uh, characters chosen by, by the visitors. For example, here we have uh, uh, a virtual visit uh, uh, in the triclinium. Uh, this is Augustus, so he's able to uh, introduce uh, 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 the, um, this place, this space, uh, uh, to the rest of the audience and talking about uh, the history of the villa, the, the events correlating with. Uh, uh, the war, wars and uh, problems in this uh, Senate area and so on. So that's another interesting thing is that every, every uh, character is able to talk uh, a story about. Uh, and uh, one of the most interesting cases was the completely reconstruction of the south part of the villa using ray tracing algorithm and that's really interesting because uh, there are very unique paintings in this part, and um, and because it's a uh, uh, um, it's the most rich part of the villa in terms of decoration. As you can see, there are a lot of marbles of the floor, opus actilane in uh, Latin terms, and uh, and the painting as well. So every uh, every reconstruction is transparent in in terms of uh, uh, what kind of sources we have used and what kind of uh, 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 recomposition we have uh, um, implemented for the final result. So like here, for example. So you, you see the movie, but everything is in real time in, in the virtual museum. Um, for understanding much better, uh, I, I show you a couple of movies. This is the first training we had in the lab, in the virtual heritage lab in Rome, where you can see the first test before of the virtual museum, so that you can much better, I think, understand. Every user has a joystick, and they are able to choose one avatar, so that every avatar is able to see the others. And they, they have a collaborative experience inside the virtual reality system. And. Uh, So this is the virtual museum by a map, so that you can see the four uh, main installation platforms and the big uh, video display, uh, big video screen uh, in stereo, so that the four users can see in stereo. The other 20 people here can see the, in, uh, in, the, in the big uh, screen in stereo. So this is, I think, is much uh, more uh, explicative uh, in terms of communication. There's this part is a stereo, the other are in mono, interactive, and th that's interesting. They don't see the same thing because every user is able to navigate in the system. The big screen is able to move a general camera through the environment. This is a sort of a big brother of, uh, of the digital system. For example, uh, this is a very short movie uh, taken before of the opening. So you can see the, here in the middle the, the display, the big display in the stereo, and the four installation in mono. Uh, of course, from this, from, from this perspective, we can see in detail what is inside every single, but you can see that here is not the same because the interaction is completely different. The idea is that the audience, the main audience, can have a holistic view of the system and uh, the uh, monographic view, so it means the individual perspective of the user with an avatar as with the capacity to go through the system, through the villa, through the rest of the landscape. The villa is just a part of the landscape. There are uh, six archaeological sites reconstructed and uh, uh, virtualized and, uh, and or he, she can uh, interact with the other users and avatars. So that in third uh, capacity is to interact with the avatar inside the system. So there are avatar users, avatar moving inside the system. 
and, and the, the big display uh, projecting, showing instead of what happens in different rooms, in different environments, and so on. Uh, there are two males and two females in terms of others. So this, it's a quite democratical way to, to use the virtuality system. And um, okay, I think it, uh, I'm out of time, so it's, <laughs> I conclude. Uh, Let me. Okay, this is the the, the out. Sorry, uh, the output. Uh, the second, the last output uh, I have shown you before is a, a, an experimental WebJS based on uh, OSG and written C++. And we've getting OSG uh, Web 4. There's a, a plugin you can install on your Mozilla or Explorer, and then you can interact with the 3D web GIS, so that there are really d diverse output of the system. Some in for a collect experience by uh, internet, some for virtual museum, very detailed, very uh, collaborative in terms of impact and immersion. And the, and the third, second life coming in a very short time. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Professor Forte? It's a fascinating talk. I hope to get to Rome soon. Are you using any of the, uh, the patterns of behavior of the people that are, are in those virtual museums in terms of feedback, in terms of interpretation? Uh, I like this question because, uh, yes, sure. Um, I. I, I don't have a movie for that, but um, every avatar is able to um, leave a trace uh, uh, with different colors. Every trace uh, is recorded by the system, so that uh, in this term it's possible to monitor the behaviors of, uh, of the users, visitors inside the system. It's a simple way, of course. They're much more complicated, to, for example, using uh, artificial intelligence and so on. But this is interesting because uh, uh, we expect to have uh, too many virtual visitors in some part of the villa for many reasons. But the big question is that uh, we don't know what happens because uh, uh, but this is not just for Rome. I think in general, in virtual reality, is. Uh, it's a problem, so that we have a lot of virtual reality or VR projects, but very few accessible, very few, apart the labs, uh, research labs, very few, so that we don't know uh, the, the feedback of, of people, the general public, of the museum visitors, for example. So it's a challenge to understand, because the theoretical premise is that we assume to know or to, to predict some behaviors, but in, in reality, the situation is, somewhere and, and, and several times really, really different. We have seen some exhibition, for example, we have organized for one month or two months. The, the result was really uh, completely different for many reasons. Uh, alphabetization of the of virtual environment, age of people, and uh, cultural uh, background, embodiment, and virtual sickness, for example. Are people are not, some people are not able to use the, the, the stereo glasses. So there, there are many reasons. However, there, every user leaves a trace. So that's interesting that you see that so many color traces for understanding what happens or what is the path, the favorite path in, in, uh, in the virtual reality system. Any other questions? I'm going to start calling on individual people here. <laughs> that was a fascinating talk. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you.